Let me show that song. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Welcome back, I should say, for everybody, because except for Devin. Devin's new. All right. So a couple quick announcements before we get started. Uh, we are a week away. We finally got an answer back from the Downtown Alliance people. Yay! So we are going to be part of this. They haven't told us where, when, or what we're doing, but we're going to be part of their trick-or-treat on Water Street, so we're going to hand out candy, and I'm going to make a nice little invite card that doesn't have a date on it. <laughs> and that way we can kind of invite people as well. Um, remember, next week, uh, we're not going to do a service. We're going to come hang out. We're going to do our little potluck thing. So let Amanda know what you're bringing. That's me. That's her over here. Um, don't forget Bible studies. Uh, Monday for the ladies. Tuesday for everybody. Uh, Ian and I are still going to be working on getting together and doing a men's thing like once a month or so. So the guys can get together and kind of bond. Because uh, we feel a little... Yes, I know. I will say that in a second. So we're going to do, all, we'll, we'll figure out, we're, we haven't quite got that far yet. We have to have a biscuits and gravy meeting for that. Um, but all the Bible studies are at 6 p.m. So please come. We would love to see you there. Um, lastly, uh, over the next couple of weeks, uh, I want to show you guys something. Um, I want to show you the vision of where... I believe God is telling us that we need to go as far as the physical building that we're supposed to wind up being in. Um, I'm actually going to see if I can't get in the building for now so I can take some pictures and talk to the people and see if they're even interested. But I believe that this is where God wants us to go. So uh, I do have some pictures of the outside, which I will we'll put up on the screen here in a little bit. Uh, not today, maybe next week. Um, but... I want to show you guys what we, you know, because I believe when we pray, we pray specifically. So that way, as we, as we move forward through our winter here, um, and as we grow, we know why we're growing and what we're trying to grow into. Okay. So that being said, anybody have any prayer requests before we start? Anyone? Well, all right then. So let's pray and we'll put on some tunes and we'll worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your time and the ability to come into your presence today. Lord, give us, give us your message. Teach us what it is that you want us to see. Continuing on with this message, Lord, this has been an eye-opener for me, and I, I can't speak for anybody else, but this has been an eye-opener for me of what it is that you want us to become. So, Lord, I ask that you open our hearts and open our minds. Bless this service today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to go throw some music on. Hopefully it's not super loud. And it disconnected. Power on. Bluetooth pairing. Bluetooth connected. There we go. This is my friend Adam, by the way. I can taste your goodness on my lips. I can hear the victory is here. I can see your spirit in our midst. Cause you bring to life every soul that is searching. You open the eyes of the lost now returning. The world comes home.
I just dropped everybody. <laughs> well, all right. So, over the last three weeks, we have been talking about what it means to be authentic. More importantly, more to the point, we've been talking about being the authentic church. We define the authentic church as a group of baptized believers that voluntarily get together and live out the great commandment, which is love one another as I love you. And the great commission, which is go out into the world, preach the gospel, baptize people in the name of Jesus. The last couple of weeks has been kind of a 50,000 foot view of what God is calling this particular church into, but I believe it's what he's calling all churches to, to become. Starting next week, we're going to start talking about what each one of us needs. Sorry, the fridge is making noise. Uh, we're going to start talking about what each one of us has to do, uh, what God has called each one of us to do to become an authentic Christian. 
So not, we're going to take it away from the church itself, and we're going to put it on us starting next week. But today we're going to complete the first part of this series, and we're going to take our cue from, uh, from Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonica, which uh, the more that I have studied out this piece, it's, this scripture, it's, it just it keeps opening and opening and opening to me, and I could probably spend a whole month in this. Uh, so let's read again. We were in uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 3 through 10. Uh, so if anybody's got their Bibles, open them up. Again, I highly recommend you guys bring them because we study, highlight, take notes. Notes are good. Um, so it says, let's see, 1 Thessalonians 3. As we pray to our God and Father about you, we think of your faithful work, your loving deeds, and endure hope, uh, an enduring hope that you, that you have because of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know, dear brothers and sisters, that God loves you and has chosen you to be his own people. For when we brought you to the good when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power, for the Holy Spirit gave you the full assurance that what we said was true. And you you know of our concern for you from the way that we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit, in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example of all the believers in Greece, throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. And now the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to the people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living and true God. And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven, Jesus, who God raised from the dead. He is the one that has rescued us from the terrors and the coming judgment. So, verse 2, I, I read New Living Translation. I don't know what, what version you guys read, but verse 2 says, uh, we always thank God. Some translations say that uh, we recall or we remember without ceasing. But I want to begin here this week. What do you guys remember? Over the last couple of weeks, I've kind of thrown a lot of information at you guys. What do you remember about what we talked about? Most people, when I ask them this, uh, I ask them, hey, do you guys remember what I preached on? And most people laugh and really uncomfortable and say, yeah, I remember. I just don't remember right now. And that's okay. Uh, but if I'm being honest, when I get up here and I talk about this stuff, this is not just a sermon to me. This is a message from God to us. It's his heart to our heart. And this is how he teaches us. So, you know, I, I mentioned before, bring your Bibles, bring a notepad, take some notes. I love watching people take notes because it, it's showing, it, it, to me, it shows that there's reverence there. You know, it says, you know, this is important. You know, this was said in the presence of God. This is important. And maybe I need to remember this. Maybe I need to study this out for myself. Because I always tell you guys, don't trust me. Because I'm just a dude and I make mistakes. We all know that. Especially when it comes to dates. But study stuff out for yourself. I highly recommend you guys study this stuff out for yourselves. Because that's where the education comes in. That's where the wisdom and the knowledge in, in, in God comes from, is when you find this stuff out for yourselves. Very good. <laughs> well, that's good, though. That, it's, it's good that you remember it. You know, because it is, again, it, it's, this is something that people don't, they don't think about this stuff. And when they do think about it, they think about it for a short period of time and then they put it away. You know, th this is something that God is telling us is very important or he wouldn't have let us keep on this for as long as he has. God expects us to take his word, put it deep in our hearts. And, and, and that, that's, that's where we, that's, 
because at some point, who knows, this may get taken away from us at some point. But if it's in our hearts, they can't take it. God expects us to take his word deeper into our heart, deeper into our minds. That way when we need it, it's in there because he's in us already. So this way we can recall it. When people ask you the questions, you can answer the questions. It's pretty easy. But he expects his word to be etched onto our hearts. With every, in every fiber of our being, he expects it to be part of us down into our souls. Okay? So let's just take a minute and go over some stuff. Uh, this, is the, this is kind of a little bit of an overview. Uh, first thing that we talked about, we talked about the foundation of the church. Remember that? It's our salvation. Salvation is the bottom line. This, this is what everything that we have is built on. That is the building block. It's, you know, the, the, the work produced by faith, the work of faith that, that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. So that foundation that we have is built on Jesus Christ saving us, pulling us out of the mess that was our lives. Anybody remember the act of faith that the church in Thessalonica did? Nobody. Okay, that's okay. They turned from idols and they started serving the living and true God. And again, back in, back in this day and age, they changed everything about themselves. Their politics was their religion and vice versa. Their lives were wrapped up in what God you serve. No matter what God you served, that defined you. And this church changed their, changed that. That's huge. That is huge. The rest of our lives are founded on this action. When we are called to turn away from the idols that we have in our lives, the rest of our lives are founded in that. We turn to God in repentance. We say, I messed up. I can't do this. We go from one direction, turn from our sinful life, and we go into a different direction. And, you know, a lot of people, when they repent, they, you know, they say, well, I said, I said this sinner's prayer, and that makes me good, right? Well, prayer is good. But this is so much more than a prayer. For Jesus to be free in our, to move in our lives, what needs to take place? Change, right? There needs to be a change in us for Jesus to be free to move or we restrict his movement. What else did we talk about? We talked about the function of the church, right? Our service. Paul reminds us that this, this was and is a labor of love. It was a labor produced by love. And that love is serving God and reaching the lost. That's what the labor of love is. And next week, we're going to start talking about being authentic Christians. You know, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Uh, we're going to look at what Jesus Believers, Christ believers, we're going to look and, and see what it is that we have to do to reconcile ourselves to God. Who is he? What has he done? What's he going to do? Those are all big questions. Because God is huge. God is big. When we realize as a church who God is, then it becomes our labor of love to serve him because again, he loved us first. He loved us first. That brings us to today. Today we're going to talk about the focus of the church, our steadfastness. The Bible calls it enduring hope here in verse 3. Now this isn't the type of hope that dreams and fantasies and you know wishes are built on 
You know, it's not that kind of hope. No. It's not hope in hope. We talked about that. It's not hope in possibilities. Instead, this is the hope that inspires patience. Because our hope, our hope is in Jesus. That's where our strength comes from. That's where our perseverance comes from. That's where the steadfastness comes from. We can endure almost anything. We can be patient with almost anything. Almost. I saw you looking at Ian. But we can be steadfast and stand strong through almost anything if we are sure of the outcome. If we know what's going to happen, we can get through it. Because we know on the other side of it, we're not only going to come out stronger, but we're going to see the better side of it when we're done. Because we know what's going to happen. We're not going to be sitting there wringing our hands and sweating about it and saying, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Because in this instance, we know what happened. You know, there's an old song that says, Weeping may endure at night, but joy comes in the morning. That's our focus, church. It's not about going through the storm. It's about when we get through it. Because the storms don't matter. So before we get into our scriptures this week, let me ask you this. What would you say the focus of our church is? If we had somebody else come in, let's say uh, one of the other churches, you know, we've, got, we've now got Victory Biker Church International in Michigan. Hi, guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, we've got Scotland. We've got Cornwall in England. Uh, let's say one of them came to visit. Completely impartial, completely different set of eyes. What would you think they would say are the focus of our churches? Anybody? The focus of our church is no different than the focus of a life, okay? It can be misleading, it can be wrong, it can be deceptive. Focus can be either intentional or unintentional. So Jesus' authentic church, what does it focus on? What does the authentic church focus on? Well, our scripture, it opens itself up and it naturally explains itself. What's the focal point of the authentic church? Let's skip down to verse 10, okay? So all the way down to the end of what we've read. And it says, And they speak of how you are looking forward to the coming of God's Son from heaven. Jesus. Whose Son? God's Son. Jesus. Wow. Is it really that simple? Yeah, yeah, it is. That's our focus. Our focus is Jesus, just for those people watching it online. That is our focus. We have, the modern day church has so confused, simple, and easy to understand. They've made this so much more complicated than it needs to be, and it hurts me. Honestly, it hurts me. Um, it may sound simple to say that Jesus is our focus or our goal, our aim, and our object. It's entirely different for someone to make that their focus, their object, and their goal and live it out. It's easy to forget, or better yet, it's probably it's easier to say, it's easier to replace Jesus with something that's more tangible. The Corinthians, uh, I love the Corinthians. Uh, first and second Corinthians are two of my favorite things to read, but the Corinthians knew all about this. They were, <laughs> they were the object of three letters that Paul wrote in this book. Uh, two of them are in the New Testament. But the, the Corinthian church, they were not so great at being focused. They kind of had this, uh, when somebody was there, 
you know, when Paul was there or one of the other disciples and apostles were there, they were really focused. They lived it to the T. And then they'd leave. And they'd kind of go blind again and forget. So they had trouble staying focused that in, in Paul's last letter to the Corinthians, it says, he says to them, he calls them out and he says, test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourself. Or do you yourselves not recognize that Jesus is in you unless you fail the test? Now, I always took this as Paul was kind of calling them out, questioning their salvation. And as I was preparing for this sermon this week, I, I was reading this uh, I was reading this discussion online, and there was this guy, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy. His name's Tony Evans. He's the pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas. He's fairly well-known online, I guess. I'd never heard of him before, but he says it better than I ever could. He says, This testing is not for the purpose of determining whether they were saved. Perhaps. But I do know this. He really wanted them to examine whether Christ was the object of their focus, affection, and attention, and whether or not Christ's abiding presence was at work through them. See? Super easy for the church to lose their focus. It's super easy for them to replace Jesus as the centerpiece of their faith. It's very easy to make any of a number of things their object of focus instead of Jesus. We can make traditions, we can make rituals, we can make schedules or ministry or countless other things the object of our attention because they have our affection and they have our attention and when they do, we lose Jesus in all of those things. Yeah, I know that stings sometimes. But the authentic church, the authentic church, it, it keeps the main thing, the main thing. And I've been saying this the last couple of weeks, and I love that saying. I need that on a t-shirt. Jesus, is. we keep the main thing, the main thing. He is the main thing. That's what makes us different. That's what makes the authentic church different. We keep the main thing the main thing. So up to now, we've talked about foundation, function, and focus. Okay, I'll start with that. That's cool. And we've also talked about the object of our focus. What's left? Well, our operation. When we focus on Jesus, we focus on what God did for him. Jesus died on a cross because there, the world was, he died for the sinfulness, he died for the hopelessness, and he died for the depravity of mankind. <laughs> That's you and me, by the way, the depravity of mankind. He shed his innocent blood so our guilt could be forgiven. He paid a price he didn't have to pay. He was completely innocent. I'm not. I'll be the first one to stand up here and tell you that. The wages of sin is death. And Jesus paid that price for us. He died. He was laid in a tomb, but God. I just love that phrase, but God. I absolutely love, but God. Jesus was raised from a physical death so we could be raised from a spiritual one. Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, says it extremely clear. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. 
the commander of the powers in this unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and the inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very nature, uh, I'm sorry, by our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy and he loves us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace that you have been saved. This is how the church operates. We offer what no other entity in the world offers. We offer people the but God that is in Jesus. We get to do that. The local church is the hope of the world. We are going to be the hope of a community. We offer people the but God that is found in Jesus. Jesus offers us a new life, church. It's a life free from death. That is the MO of the authentic church. It comes through Jesus. Life from death. But I want to be clear on something. Okay, I want to make sure you guys understand. I want to be very, very clear. Our salvation, mine and yours, only comes through recognition of our need, the repenting of our sin, and the redemption of our soul. Okay? Here's the deal. We have to come to a place in our lives where we know we're lost. That God's our only hope and that repentance is the only path that we're going to be able to take. And we need to trust that He is our answer. And if it doesn't happen like that, it doesn't happen. The Bible teaches that there is only one way to be saved. We need to repent and we need to believe. You won't repent if you don't believe. The authentic church makes saving salvation and the redemption of lost souls a priority. It makes it their top priority. Why? Because of this one last thing. One last thing. The outcome. Jesus rescues us from the coming wrath. It says that right here in verse 10. The authentic church sees itself on a rescue mission. Here's what we forget. We forget that there is a coming wrath. And God's going to execute that judgment on sin. And by executing that judgment on sin, He is going to execute that judgment on sinners. There's two inescapable truths. Wages of sin is death, and that death is a place of fire. Okay? Jesus said in Matthew 5, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. Matthew 23, Jesus asked the religious people, how can you escape being condemned from hell? Jude. Jude writes, save others by snatching them from the fire. This seems to be something that the modern day church has forgotten. That there is a heaven to gain and a hell to escape from. There isn't a person alive that I want to see go to hell. People that have done me wrong infinite amount of times. I want to see them in heaven just like everybody else. The gift of, number two, sorry, number two. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. This is why we have to become an authentic church. It's, we, I want us to be a church like the one Jesus created. We offer Jesus as an answer, as the answer, as the only answer. The gospel of Jesus is the good news of hope and help and life 
in this world and beyond this world. And there are so many people in this community that don't know that. That's why we're here. Matthew, verse, Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is basically essentially saying, I'll build my church, a church that's going to attack the gates of hell, and the gates of hell aren't going to stand a chance. Why? Because I'm going to be with them, and I have the keys. Whatever my church locks or unlocks in heaven or in hell will be done. The authentic church focuses on snatching souls from hell. It's right in one of the, the taglines of our church. We're snatching souls out of the junkyard of hell because we want the people that nobody else wants. The authentic church may do a lot of things, but at the forefront of it all, Jesus has to be there. He has to be. The risen Lord has come to rescue us. We are currently living through the greatest rescue story ever. Are we following his example? Are we rescuing the perishing people? Are we rescuing the people that are lost, the people that are broken, the people that have no idea what they're, what they're missing, the people that think it's funny that they're going to go to hell? Are we even trying to reach these people? Because that is what we are called to do. And if we're not doing that, why aren't we doing it? Is it simply because we're afraid of what they're going to say? Is it simply because they're going to think that we're weird because we're one of those Jesus freak people? You get over that, I promise. You get over it. I'm not asking people to go knock on doors unless God tells you to go and do that. We're not the door knocking kind of church. <laughs> but it's time to be vocal and it's time to share your story and tell people what God's done for you. It's not time to argue about semantics and argue about theology and argue about you know, different denominational doctrine. It's not about that. The time is now to share what it is that Jesus Christ has done for you. It's time to be vocal and it's time to be bold because that's what God is asking us to do. We are a small group of people that God has chosen to turn this world upside down. And I believe that. I believe that with everything that's within me. That he has chosen us very much like he chose the disciples to flip the world back over again. This little ragtag group of people that we have. I love you guys for, still, for being here through this. We are the ones that are going to change this place. Because they're going to look at us and they're going to go, they don't look like they're supposed to be the ones that do this. Right. You know, they're, they're the, the motorcycle ride and tattooed, covered, outspoken, sometimes a little foul-languaged people. Yeah. Jesus uses us too. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you so much for opening our hearts and opening our minds and giving us this message. This is so important for us to understand. It's so important for us to know what it is that you're calling us as a physical church to be and how to help other churches and other people to get to where it is that you've called them to be. Lord, give us the courage, give us the boldness, give us the understanding and the words that we're going to need to be able to reach the lost and the people that, that are already on the way that are going to at first shun this idea of being authentic. Let's get this, let's get all of the churches back to being authentic. Because I know this is what you've called, and this is one of the primary focuses 
of this church is helping people become authentic. This is not about being fake and this is not about being anything that has anything other than other to do than being a follower of you. So Lord, as we go our separate ways, as we get together and socialize after this, Lord, please give us the courage to open our mouths. Even if it's just to one person, give us the courage to witness to somebody, to open up our hearts so maybe they can open up theirs to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, thank you guys. I'm going to go shut off the camera.